the public, including school children, along residential streets. At about the time of the attack, the court heard Ali sent a WhatsApp message apologising to family and friends, explaining it was for the sake of Allah. Jurors then heard he spent 14 minutes on the phone to his sister. Ali, from Kentish Town in North London, has denied preparing terrorist attacks and murder, and his trial continues at the Old Bailey. Charlotte Lynch reporting. Coming up in the next hour, it is Tuesday's edition of Cross Question. Joining me on the panel are Alex Shelbrook, uh, Conservative MP for Elmet and Rothwell. He's also head of the UK delegation to the NATO Assembly, but far more important than that, he's a fellow hammer. Charlotte Nichols is Labour MP for Warrington North. Alex Dean is Senior Managing Director F at FDI Consulting, author of the book Lessons from History. And Matt Stadlin is here too, broadcaster and author. They're here to take your calls over. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call. And of course, you can watch us on Global Player. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock. The Ukrainian president says there's nothing left of Mariupol, which has come under near-constant Russian shelling. At least 10 hospitals have been completely destroyed and fighting's continuing around the city as well as in Kharkiv. Earlier, Volodymyr Zelensky says his country's on the brink of surviving the Russian invasion, but called for more help from the West. Labour's deputy leader, Angela Rayner, has told LBC NATO have been solid in their response so far. We should work with our international allies to try and de-escalate this, but also say to Putin this is not acceptable and we will not mm. tolerate this behaviour. He has, he has yep. committed war crimes, he has killed innocent civilians and he is responsible for that. P&O says it'll pay out £36.5 million in redundancy costs, thought to be the biggest in British maritime history. Some of the 800 laid-off staff will receive 170000 each. Met Police say they're committed to tackling corruption within their ranks. A report's found a number of failings, including not properly supervising officers with criminal convictions. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 34 points at 74.76. The pound buys $1.00. 32 and 1 euro 20. LBC weather largely dry and clear tonight with lows of 3. Another warm day tomorrow with plenty of sunshine but some cloud for Northern Ireland. Highs of 18 degrees. From Global's newsroom for LBC, I'm Lucinda Horsley. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, a very good evening. It's three minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to Tuesday's Cross Question. On the panel with me for the next hour are Alex Shelbrook, Conservative MP for Elmet and Rothwell. Uh, Charlotte Nichols isn't quite here yet. She's Labour MP for Warrington North. She's been voting, which makes me wonder why Alex hasn't been voting. Was he paired? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Alex Dean is Senior Managing Director at FTI Consulting and author of Lessons from History. And Matt Stadlin joins us, broadcaster and author. So we're looking forward to hearing their views on your questions 0345 6060 973 and do feel free to ask think things other ask about things other than ukraine or indeed the spring statement i'm sure we'll have plenty of calls on those but let's be a bit innovative something ethical something moral i feel a moral question coming on over the course of the next 60 minutes so you can also of course watch us on global player 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Let's go to our first question. It's Mick in Leeds. Hello, Mick. Mick, are you with us? I am indeed. Good evening. Thank goodness for that. What would you like to ask? I'd like to ask your panel, do they think the national insurance increase, uh, should it be suspended? Is that what you think? You think it should be suspended or, or maybe abolished altogether? Or have you got another solution? I think it should at least be suspended, taking into account the fact that Rishi Sunak's been telling us for the past year that job numbers have increased, 
and therefore surely income tax revenue should have increased so we should have some wiggle room to actually suspend the increase for at least the next three years which gives people a chance to survive taking into account the massive increases in um, shopping bills uh, utility bills petrol bills and I think Rishi Sunak should also start reducing the VAT rates on those issues uh, regarding the utility can, bills and the okay, petrol. Okay, well, those are all things that we'd love to see happen, but how can you do that without jeopardising the public finances? We're already borrowing £138 billion a year. That's the third highest in history. Well, the fact is that they've actually said, as I've said, that um, job numbers have increased. Um, at, at the, they're at the highest rate ever. And therefore, surely their income tax revenue should have increased with that. Therefore, we must have some wiggle room with regard to that. And they haven't spent mm -hmm. as much as they said with uh, okay. during right. COVID. Well, there's that phrase which seems to be the phrase of the day, wiggle room, Alex well, Dean. I can tell you why. It's because Sir Charlie Bean, who was head of the Office of Budget Responsibility, said it. He said that Rishi Sunak's going to have about 50 billion of wiggle room tomorrow that he wasn't expecting because of higher than expected tax receipts and lower than expected government borrowing. So in my view, Mick is absolutely right. We should be suspending a rise in national insurance. One, because we can, it seems, afford to on the numbers. And secondly, because national insurance insurance is a fraud upon the public. There is no pot of money for you at the end of your retirement, Ian. Uh, there is no pot of money saved away by the state for you. It's not hypothecated. It's just another form of tax. Now, we can argue on another day whether we should get rid of national insurance altogether, which might be a more honest way of taxing people. But in the meantime, we definitely shouldn't be putting it up in these current climates, current climate. Um, the, the interesting thing there, you said, was that this guy was head of the OBR. Have the OBR ever got a forecast right in history? Um, I think they've been pretty close on several occasions, but of course these are inexact figures. I, ac I accept your, the thrust of your point that they're never going to be bang on to the penny, but they're not. I don't think they're going to be out by fifty billion, and I certainly don't think um, I don't think he's he's wrong by that much. As Sunak's figures, I think on government borrowing will show. Matt Stadlin. Yeah, I think that we absolutely have to make sure that those on the lowest incomes or lower incomes do not have to foot this bill. So I don't think we should get rid of national insurance entirely. I think people like me, people I imagine like most of us in this studio, some of those listening, should pay more so that those on lower incomes don't have to pay as much. The cost of living crisis is hitting people right now. People talk about it, analysts talk about it coming down the road. It's already hitting people in the face. People are already having to, and I see Alec nodding his head there, people are already having to choose between heating their homes. I know it's March now, but it's still chilly, and eating. And we don't want to live in a society where that's the case. Alec. Well, yeah, first of all, I was nodding my head because <clears throat> um, decades I've been on the doorstep. Um, and you, you bring out a policy, so let, let's go back to, say, um, in the autumn when we said um, we were breaking the triple lock for this year and people were angry about it and, and, you know, they bring it up. That's politics. But what I'm finding on the doorstep now is a real fear. Mm. And, and, and that is something that's really got to be it, taken as, notice As Ronald Reagan might say, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, and I know for a fact, look, I know this. I know that Conservative MPs have been making it crystal clear to the Chancellor about this fear factor that is there. I know that um, the NI rise is particularly a very unpopular rise and, and it's not one I'd like to see postponed, suspended. I'd like to see it scrapped altogether. Yeah, but yeah. I also know, as, as you um, mentioned, Ian, that um, the public finances are in a terrible state. Um, and But I think that what, what we've been saying to the Chancellor is, is that you've really got to look at energy overall, fuel in the tank, gas prices, electricity prices, because it's all very well talking about, well, we'll see how it pans out, etc. I am seeing real fear in people's faces. And it's because I think to a certain extent... Look, we could maybe the chance is going to knock five pence off um, diesel tomorrow. It could well have gone up five pence by the time he finishes at yeah. the dispatch box. And, 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 you know, and, and, and let's remember the there is wriggle room when it comes to petrol. Is it wriggle or wiggle? Can we just decide? Let's that? call it wriggle. We can wiggle our bums if we want. But <laughs> there, there is a huge amount of space to do something on fuel duty, and that's because we pay a huge amount of tax on fuel. And it's not a progressive tax because. It, Everyone, or no matter how much money they have to spend, has to pay the same yep. when they go to the fuel so, so why would he then take, say, five pence off fuel duty? I suspect it might actually be more than that. Me too. Because that will affect... I mean, it would affect everybody, but the fact that you own a car 
means that you're probably not one of the lowest paid people generally. I, mean, I suppose it depends oh. if it's an old well, car. There's a lot of people that are very low wage. I know, I know I'm generalising because in rural areas a car is not a luxury, Essential. it's, an, it's yeah. a necessity. But broadly speaking, that will benefit people who it doesn't need to benefit. Why not target this exactly at the people that Alec is talking about who are fearful of what, not necessarily what's happening now, but what might happen in six months' time? Because we had Minette Batters from the NFU on last night, and she put the fear of God into us all about what's likely to happen to food prices over the next year. Um, so I think this this idea about people having fear is absolutely bang on, and we, we hear it on our calls every day. So why not, why not um, target this at people who, who really need it? I think it's a really interesting analysis of um, does, does, does cutting fuel duty just affect the people who have cars? Actually, it feeds through the entire system. It's feeding into food prices. It's feeding into public transport. Um, it feeds across. Personally, I think it's one aspect. What I really want to see, and I, I, I don't think this is going to happen, but what I'd really like to see is the um, eco-taxes taken off the energy bills and put into the general taxation area, there are commitments to those taxes. It's not just raising tax. There are contracts that have got to be satisfied, etc., etc. But at this moment in time, when it's a percentage of the cost and that cost has risen so incredibly high, um, I'd like to just see a, a break put on that and move that tax, which... Um, satisfies, as I say, contracts, moved into general taxation for now. Because th this... It, it really is. I mean, I, I, on the doorstep, the people I'm talking to, their, their energy bills have roughly tripled. Yeah. Tripled in a month. And uh, just to finish the point I was making, because I think you, you raise an important question, can can it be done in a more targeted way? And that's a response to me saying it's not progressive the way we tax fuel at the moment. I agree with you. If we can find a way of doing that, cutting income tax, I don't think that is on the cards at all. But just so everyone is aware, when you go to the petrol pump and it's pound eighty or whatever... Literally 90p, something like 90p of that is going to the government. Some of it is in tax fuel duty and some of it, a smaller proportion, is in VAT. That is a massive amount. I, I have to travel myself. I'm relatively well off. I have to travel two times a week between London and Tunbridge Wells, where you're from, that's where my girlfriend lives. It's yes, extraordinary. That, that's not to visit me. That's not to visit you. <laughs> Occasionally we go Occasionally. for water. But no, it, it's, it's unbelievably expensive. Yes. And so I can only imagine for those who are really not very well off... Those who live in rural places, as you say, on the train. Those it could do the train as well. Those those who are in rural communities, also people who have to drive for a living. They drive to get to work, or they drive because they have to deliver stuff for the rest of us. Yeah, I, I also want to point out that when people who are on the margin of you know, keeping their head above water are doing the maths on what they can afford. The fuel that they buy is coming from the family budget. It's not just somebody who might be able to afford mm. it or not, and that's a good place to put it. It comes out of a finite pot that the hardworking families have got, and this is the time to give them a break, mm. both on their domestic fuel and on their uh, vehicle. Uh, and this is a political issue too, isn't it? In the, in the sense that there's an, going to be an election sometime in the next 18 months, mm. And it's very rare that parties win elections when people feel worse off, isn't it? And inevitably, we're not, have got, we're not going to get out of this worse off period by the time the next election comes. I, I would agree with that, but I think to a certain extent we're in such unprecedented situations that we, we can't be thinking electorally, we've got to be thinking about what's best for people. I think that argument holds water, but it also depends on do they think it'll be better off with the other lot, and that is a general election campaign, mm. and you never know where that's going to go. I think what, what I, I'm hoping the Chancellor does tomorrow, um, and maybe not even just tomorrow, maybe he has to adjust it as time goes on, is just look at this situation that people are facing right now because it is terrifying for people but and it, I've never ever seen that before. But if you are going to put it in party, party political terms, which Ian did, then it's a good warning to the Conservative Party because Labour is advocating not proceeding with this national insurance yeah. rise and if you let the Labour Party get to the wrong side of you on tax cutting, it's very difficult to say what the Tory party stands for. I uh, know that they'll though, I, I mean, I know, if he drops the national insurance rise tomorrow, the next Labour party thing is where it's a big tax cut put tax it up cut yeah i know, I know. Donors and everything else i mean that is but, but it is good it is good. someone who comes from the left not the far left but the sort of i would say moderate left i'm sure we disagree on a lot of things disagree with all three of you on a lot of things but it's good to hear you say that we should put people's interests before party politics yeah, here, even if we've got 18 months only to an, an election as we're now hearing and and that's absolutely vital because the fear is still that sunak will hold back some money 
when we are already, as I say, in this cost of living crisis, in order that he can then cut taxes near an election. Yeah. That would be entirely cynical. I, I, I'm not going to break any confidence. I'm not going to break any confidence when I say I said exactly to the Chancellor, if you think people are going to thank you for that, you're wrong. It's good to hear that. Well, I might put that to him tomorrow when he's here in the studio from 7 o'clock taking LBC listeners' calls. Right, we thank you very much, Mick, for that question. We'll move on to a very different subject in just a moment. You're listening to or watching LBC's Cross Question. It's quarter past eight. LBC. St Pancras Clinical Research is looking for participants with painful osteoarthritis to take part in clinical trials assessing new medicines, aiming to reduce pain, increase mobility and improve quality of life. If you have osteoarthritis of the knee and experience pain frequently during the day, you might be suitable for a clinical trial. Get access to expert medical care and get involved in cutting-edge research. Sign up now at stpancrasclinicalresearch.com. Sam, put down that spoon. It's time to go to the movies. It's 7 a.m. Popcorn o'clock with a Samsung Galaxy S22 series. But I've got work. Does work have a dynamic AMOLED 2X display? No. What's on? Entertainment. That's what. With 12 months Disney Plus on us. Mmm, bingy. Get back out there with the epic Samsung Galaxy S22 series. Buy yours at Samsung.com. Disney Plus auto renews at £7.99 a month. 18 plus only. Terms apply. Hi, I'm Dr. Nikki Kanani, GP and Medical Director of Primary Care in England. COVID-19 is still with us, so it's good that 12 to 15-year-olds can now get a second COVID-19 vaccine. Vaccines give your children the best possible protection against the virus and help to keep them in school. Get your 12 to 15-year-old vaccinated 12 weeks after their first dose. Book online or find your nearest walk-in centre at nhs.uk slash COVID vaccination. We've got loads of great offers at Morrison's this Mother's Day, like bottles of the best Prosecco, now only £5.99 each. A one-litre bottle of Bombay Sapphire, now only £16.99. Morrison's. Make good things happen. Majority of stores subject to availability. Bombay excludes Scotland and Wales. Offers end 27th of March. Please drink responsibly. My prostate cancer was, thankfully, caught in the nick of time. But it shouldn't be down to luck. Men at higher risk are... Aged over 50. Those with a family history of the disease. Or black men or the 45. Check your risk of prostate cancer now. Search Risk Checker or visit prostatecancerUK.org. Men, we are with you. Big Tasty, please. Ah, uh, oh, no, wait. Uh, the Big Tasty with bacon... Yeah, oh, in fact, it's got to be the Big Tasty Barbecue. <laughs> uh, um, big Tasty, Big Tasty with bacon, an all-new Big Tasty Barbecue. Three Big Tasties, one big decision. <whistles> Served after 11am, subject to availability at participating restaurants until the 26th of April. To help you travel with confidence on the TfL network, we're cleaning regularly with antiviral disinfectant, providing over 1,000 free hand sanitizer stations and frequently circulating fresh air on tubes, buses and trains. To help everyone feel safe, we strongly recommend that you continue to wear a face covering when travelling on our services, unless you are exempt. Thank you for helping to keep yourself and others safe. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Alex Shelbrook, Conservative MP, is here. Alex Dean, author of Lessons from History. Quick 30-second plug, Alex, for the book. Thank you very much. 94 stories ranging from ancient Greece and Rome through to, very recently, lots of daring do. It's the classic toilet book, Ian. It's aimed <laughs> squarely at the smallest room in the house. Appeals to me, but couldn't you get to 100? Do you know, you asked me very kindly... Oh, have I said you, that you, before? You did, and you, and you were right. At the time, I was just so relieved to get to my word limit, I put the pen down. <laughs> my book's for every room in the house, but... Uh, your, uh, yes, <laughs> your book is really good. How to Right, enough of that. Let's go to our next question. It's a text question from Julie in Islington. He says, why are so many people implying Nazanin Sagari Radcliffe should be more grateful? Alex Shelbrook. <laughs> Social media pile on? I mean, I, at the end of the day, I, I, I think we've tragically started to get used to that no matter what anybody's circumstances are they seem to get attacked from one way or the other. I saw um, an article today about um, the chap who was run over in the terrorist attacks five years ago and because he was seen to walk away he's then had a pile on saying um, you know you're a fraud, you're this that and the other and he said he's had a lot of um, online bullying and I think that um, um, when we say she should be more grateful it's, it's a ridiculous thing to say and, and it just seems to be this whole 
world of um, social media that almost has to be controversial and start an argument. I really have disdain for it. And the people that are saying this generally think that she should have thanked Liz Truss, the Foreign Secretary, because she came out under her watch. Now, whatever the circumstances were, she was the one that affected it. So therefore, so people say she deserves a bit of thanks. Well, look, I mean, I think Liz has done a, a great job, I think, um, to actually get the issue resolved um, and actually not be lent on by the Americans anymore and just say we're going to make our own decision. Is, is and that why you think this money wasn't paid before? I'm, I'm always convinced of it. Yeah. I think um, I think that Liz decided that she was no longer going to and go down the road. I've got no inside line on this, Ian, but this is just oh, my that's analysis. You have. Um, but um, yeah, I think she just took the decision that we're not going to mess around with this anymore. Um, but. How do you define grateful? Did, did did she want to make some big public display of all thank you and, and worship or anything else? Or perhaps she said thank you in the background, but I think he just misses the point. You know, she, she's a mother, she's a wife, she's yeah. detained unlawfully, effectively, and she's home. I mean, Matt. Yeah, I, I watched it live, the press conference. And first of all, she was grateful. She was grateful to a whole host of people, not least, of course, her husband and also her, her young daughter for being so patient. What her husband's been through as well as Nazanin is, I mean, most of us just can't even begin to imagine that. Should she be grateful to Liz Truss? I thought it was fascinating because her husband, Richard, he did thank Liz Truss. He did mm. thank the Foreign Secretary. She then, very publicly, she didn't have to do this, but so she was obviously making a point. None of us know exactly what went on behind the scenes. But she very publicly said, I I'm going to beg to differ with you on this, and I'm not going to thank the Foreign Secretary because this should have happened five Foreign Secretaries ago. It should have happened six years ago. And I think if we look at the history of this government's dealing with the case, it has fallen short, unfortunately. Boris Johnson, I think it's widely agreed, made things more difficult for Nazanin. And anyone who's pointing the finger, and I agree with what Alex said about social media parlance. I mean, I've been the, I've been on the wrong end of many social media parlance. The water of a duck's back for me. But I think, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's a lot of racism. I think there's a lot of misogyny. This is someone who, who spent six years separated from her family at the hands of a despotic regime. I mean, the Iranian regime is difficult to exaggerate how wicked it is, and solitary confinement. So anyone who is choosing her as the target for an online pylon is, for me, in that, in that, in that respect, beneath contempt. Alex? Yeah, I think, too, that there's a real role for patience in life that seems lacking in the current social media environment. Because even if, I'm not saying that I do, even if you think she's got it wrong because she's angry, she's upset after six years of imprisonment. Traumatised. Yeah, why not judge? I, I mean, perhaps she shouldn't have been put shoved in front of cameras, but I'm afraid that was inevitable. If she does get it wrong, well, so what? And why pile in? Now, where uh, your listener's question at the heart of it, I think, there there may be something getting at it which which is which has, does, does have to be said, which is that in the conference that she did, the criticism was aimed at our government, which was trying to get her out, and not at the Iranian government, which kept her in. Now, that is a legitimate point, but she's not some press spokesman, is she? Right? She's not some no. trained media personality ready to bounce out from six years of imprisonment to go and defend her cause. So my point is, even if she did get it wrong, why are people having a go at her? I don't think she holds a candle. Let's just be clear. I don't think she holds a candle for the Iranian regime. No, but she didn't criticise them. But, but there may be all sorts of reasons. I mean, I parents, I think. I yes, her family's still, there. Yeah, I, exactly. I understand so, all of that. But people who don't, who might not and think she, about that. She was understandably careful about, I think, uh, uh, my colleague Theo Osher would ask her a question yes. about um, did she have any acts of kindness from a guard? And she wouldn't answer it. Which, because she'll get them in trouble. Uh, exactly. Yeah. I thought she exactly. was brilliant in the way she and refused she to answer calm, those questions. She was calm, she had poise. Yeah. I mean, I, I have to say... She's going to be a member if, of parliament She'll been, be alongside you, Alec, on the Green Bench. If I had been in prison... i sure she'd be alongside me. No, okay. <laughs> you. Fair enough. You know, Fair enough. I saw the photo shoot with Keir Starmer. Yeah. <laughs> if, if I had been in prison for six years, do I think I would have been able to do that press conference like that? No, yeah. I don't. And she had a sense of humour as well. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a very impressive performer. Um, right, let's move on to our next question. Julie, thank you for that text. It's Annie in Carnforth. Annie, hello, what would you like to ask? Oh, hello, Ian and panel. Um, I'd like to ask what the um, panel think about the comment by the uh, representative of the World Health Organization today um, concerning uh, the um, Britain, France, Italy and Germany ending their um, COVID regulation um, protections too soon. Um, and what do, they, what do you think about um, ending free testing from the 1st of April, particularly given that case rising, uh, cases are rising and hospitalisations and with the uh, cost of living crisis, 
many people aren't going to be able to afford to buy the tests and may need them to visit their um, vulnerable so relatives. Th this announcement, I'd have to admit, has passed me by. So did they criticise all those countries or just us? No, all, all of them. All of them. Yeah. OK, so um, we are joined, we're delighted to be joined by Charlotte Nicholl, who's been busy voting. I'm gathered there were six votes rather than two, so you are forgiven. <laughs> yes, I've uh, been... Been a busy day on Indeed. the old voting um, Let me just repeat the basis of Annie's question here, so you've, you've got got it. Um, what does the panel think of the WHO criticising Britain and some other European countries for letting go of COVID restrictions too soon? Matt? Well, I think it's really tough on people who are not going to be able to afford to be regularly tested when the tests become free because they're going to have to choose between putting loved ones at risk, putting colleagues at risk or, or, or simply not going into work. I've just come back from my first overseas trip since summer 2019 holiday in South Africa and everyone has to wear a mask there still, even outdoors was my understanding. And they were saying, I hear in England, you don't have to do that anymore. We want that, we want that. So of course, everyone is itching to get on. I've been a massive critic of this government. I've been a massive critic of Boris Johnson and specifically his handling of the coronavirus crisis. But at some point, we are going to have to move on. So broadly speaking, given deaths are not very high, given at the moment the pressure on the NHS doesn't seem to be as high as it might have been feared, even though a lot of people are getting it, and anecdotally it seems so many who were passed by by the virus for the last two years are now getting it for the first time. At the moment, it seems like they've got it roughly, roughly right, but we have to reserve judgment and we have to be agile if things get out of control again, because you only have to look at Hong Kong and China, where apparently, that surprisingly for authoritarian regime China, vaccination rates are, are very low comparatively. It's running rampant again. Alec? Well, I mean, <laughs> what, what to add? I mean, um, look, you two are agreeing far too much. I know. I, I, but, but, stop it. But I do think this. I think this. We have to, at some point, rip the plaster off and go back to a normal society. Um, one thing the government's been brilliant at in the last two years is scaring the life out of everybody. And, um, and there has to come a point where we allow people to have the confidence to go out again and move forward. I, I agree that, that there may come a point where, heaven forfend, we have to do something new if suddenly hospitalisation rates were going through the roof. But there's no real evidence of that happening at this stage. We do have a very high vaccination rate. I think it's interesting that the WHO are criticising lots of European countries. But a lot off the top of my head, Ian, from, from, from those um, countries mentioned, I think they've all got high vaccination rates. Um, and I think it's... Um, I think, you know, the time came where it was like, look, we have to start getting back to normal, not least because um, a lot of my constituents rely... They have businesses that rely on the footfall in Leeds in the actual city. I was surprised how many there were, actually. Um, so all the time we have working from home or restricting going out, actually, they are businesses that they really can't um, get any massive support for um, because of the nature of their businesses. They rely on the footfall and, and they are thriving businesses as long as you've got the footfall okay. in the city. So I think it's important that we try to get back to as many areas as possible because I think it's too easy to say, oh, well, I, I just want to carry on working from home because it, people don't recognise the other sectors of the economy that rely on a normal life. Charlotte Nichols. I think that we're all keen for things to go back to normal and the last two years have been abysmal for everyone but the problem is that when we take restrictions back too soon or when we make it much more difficult for people to be responsible to access regular testing what we in fact end up creating is a kind of two-tier system because people like my mum for example who's clinically extremely vulnerable she's really concerned about things going back to normal not because she's concerned about you know footfall and things like this but she's concerned about not being able to access a test i've got constituents who are coming to me who work in you know very low paid jobs who are saying that they want to be able to go and visit their parents in care homes now that that's something that's allowed but they're having difficulty getting either a free test full stop 
or not able to afford having to pay for them. And what we'll end up doing is having kind of freedom for most people, but at the expense of a small minority of people who have either got underlying health conditions or who, for other reasons, are not able to participate fully without everyone else still doing things like testing if they're concerned. And I think for people in my generation in particular, what was mentioned before about, you know, anecdotally, certainly it seems to be something that's closing in around me at the moment because there's sort of an uptick in Parliament. Mm. Um, You know, someone in my office had it just last week. Um, Someone else in the office next door has got it at the moment. And it's sort of people that for the last two years, because they've been able to access tests regularly, because everyone's been testing regularly, it's kind of felt like the risk is lower and people have been able to live relatively normally. Whereas now, it sort of seems that we're having this uptick in people in their kind of 20s and 30s in particular picking it up. And of course, you know, a mutation only takes one person to... What restrictions would you reverse, though? Well, I'd, I think that... In terms of restrictions themselves, I think that we have taken quite a good um, and measured approach in terms of reducing some of those. But in order to do that and in order to live alongside COVID, which we're now being asked to do, things Mm. like testing and keeping the restriction in place around if you test positive for COVID, it shouldn't be guidance that you stay at home it should still be something that's enforced because ultimately most of the time it's not people's individual decision to continue to go out it'll be their employer forcing them to come in because the law doesn't protect them are there really any employers that would say yeah you've got to come in if you've got covid you would be very surprised looking at my mailbag you would hope that most employers are good and responsible and decent and the majority of them are but particularly um, employers in low-paying sectors who do not have a particularly That's good track record of worker concent- like you know. Or, or, or it might be at the other end of the spectrum, because I saw uh, in City AM a headline about a city firm saying, if, if you, as long as you feel all right, and if you've tested positive, come in. So it's, Seriously? It's, yeah. So it's not, it's not just at one end of the, the spectrum, but let me have a go at your caller's question, because if you used to take the starting position that everyone before me has said that you've got, we want to get back to normal eventually at some point, then I think you have to accept that it's a pragmatic pragmatic decision that not no you're never going to get time when everyone agrees with it it's a pragmatic decision about roughly when you reckon it is unless your position is until we have no covid which i think is used to saying we're never going to reopen unless you're going to take the new zealand hermit kingdom position and in the end you get it anyway yeah. right unless your position is no covid you're, you're going to have to choose a time and it's on that pragmatic decision i reckon the government's probably got it about right you know our rates are lower than the other european countries that were mentioned not necessarily because of virtue but because we had our wave sooner if we were in south korea's shoes right now doing two to three hundred thousand cases a day one's position would be different but we're well, not. rates are very very high still it's just that deaths are low yes and and hospitalizations but i mean my friend and colleague jackie smith she got it just after spending a weekend with me which of course made me think oh have I got... so i have been sort of testing rigorously thanks for letting us know <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I haven't i haven't got it halfway through the show you told us <laughs> But, I mean, I'm glad she, I was late now. She, she, she is. And that you're that far away. She is feeling really rough. I mean, a week I'm sorry on. To hear it. That's interesting it. as well. Lots of the people who are getting it now, triple jab people, yeah. are getting it as a heavy flu. But yeah. that's because your caller was hinting at this WHO uh, position, which was that the new variants are more contagious or more spread more spread it's spread um, more easily but they are not more dangerous and mm. I, so that was that's contrary to, to, to what you've said well i'm off to present the rest of the show from that set over yeah. there <laughs> uh, we'll take more of your questions in a moment um annie thank you for that it's eight thirty three on lbc let's get the latest news headlines from lucinda horsley Ukraine has appealed to Russia to allow 100,000 people still trapped in Mariupol to leave. President Volodymyr Zelensky says there's nothing left of the city and called for more support from Western leaders. P&O says £36.5 million in redundancy costs will be shared among the 800 staff who lost their jobs last week. The company's been heavily criticised for the way it laid them off. Labour's deputy leader Angela Rayner has hinted the party would look at a wealth tax to increase NHS funding ahead of tomorrow's spring statement. Official figures suggest Chancellor Rishi Sunak could be in a better position to help those struggling with the rising cost of living. LBC weather largely dry and clear tonight with lows of three. Warm and sunny again for most tomorrow, but some cloud for Northern Ireland and Western Wales. Highs of 18 degrees. LBC. There are two ways businesses can trade goods with the EU. 
Number one, fill in form haute cuisine and submit documents carte blanche and déjà vu along with triplicate copies of your joie de vivre certificate. Did I mention déjà vu? Or method number two, enter everything in minutes on Customs Pro and we'll do the rest, saving you time, money and stress. Find out more at customspro.co.uk. You won't regret a rien. Whether you're searching for kettlebells, or boxing gloves, how you pay matters. Visa, a network protecting your payments online. Everyone loves getting a great price on the favourite things, right? That's why at Sainsbury's we're not just giving you nectar points, we're giving you your own nectar prices too. Yep, tailored discounts on hand-picked products we think you'll like when you shop in store with Smartshop. And the more you shop, the more tailored your discounted products become. Fancy? So what are you waiting for? Check your Nectar app to learn more about your prices. Smart Shop and digital Nectar registration required. Items subject to availability. Exclusions apply. Visit nectar.com slash mynectarprices for more info. Sam, put down that spoon. It's time to go to the movies. It's 7 a.m. Popcorn o'clock with a Samsung Galaxy S22 series. But I've got work. Does work have a dynamic AMOLED 2X display? No. What's on? Entertainment. That's what. With 12 months Disney Plus on us. Mmm, bingy. Get back out there with the epic Samsung Galaxy S22 series. Buy yours at Samsung.com. Disney Plus auto renews at £7.99 a month. 18 plus only. Terms apply. Life is about sharing those magical moments. And food shouldn't be any different. For over 35 years, Marouche has been perfecting this experience with their delicious food, warm hospitality and live entertainment. Authentic Lebanese cuisine made the traditional way. Marouche, your family restaurant. Book now at marouche.com. Show someone close to you their mum of a kind. Order them a beautiful bouquet at zingflowers.com. Amazing every Mother's Day. To help you travel with confidence on the TfL network, we're cleaning regularly with antiviral disinfectant, providing over 1,000 free hand sanitizer stations and frequently circulating fresh air on tubes, buses and trains. To help everyone feel safe, we strongly recommend that you continue to wear a face covering when travelling on our services, unless you are exempt. Thank you for helping to keep yourself and others safe. To the Mayor of London and TfL, every journey matters. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Ben in Exeter says, I tested positive for COVID this weekend. My employer insisted I work because the legislation had changed. Apart from sneezing a lot, I felt well enough to work. Hopefully, I didn't infect anyone. Well, hopefully you didn't, but I, I still find this quite shocking. I never wanted to do another COVID phone-in ever again, but I'm, I'm thinking that might be one to sort of store up because uh, people have obviously got some interesting stories there. With us in the studio, Alex Shelbrook, Charlotte Nichols, Alex Dean and Matt Stadlin. Let's go to our next caller. It's Rowan in Manchester. Hello, Rowan. Hi, yeah. Uh, Hi, what would you like to ask? Uh, here's your uh, ethical or moral question for you. Why hasn't hitting children been outlawed in England like it was in Wales today? Um, I was reading about this this morning. I didn't actually know it was happening in Wales. Is it a blanket ban that any any form of slapping, hitting a child it will, will could result in someone being arrested? As far as I understood it, yes. I'm no legal expert. Mm. OK. Um, how many of you have children around this table? I think this is very unrepresentative. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't think any of you do, do you? child-free panel, so... Alex, kick well, us off. it does mean that no kick one gets off, to claim... Kick us off, All right. <laughs> no one gets to claim kind of um, the upper hand on, on knowledge. But then again, we all were children once, and um, we all have our own experiences of, of childhood. Ch beating children is appalling. Hitting children properly and with a, you know, is, is completely wrong. 
on the other hand, I, I am told by those who do have children, and I'm told by uh, those who look after children, that there is the occasional time when, with the young child whose instinct is to run out into the road or put their fingers in the socket, that a smack on the legs has done no harm. And then, in fact, it's something that they remember. Now, that is something that people often say. I, I was smacked occasionally as a child when I did something wrong. Uh, I'm not saying that's the right or wrong approach. It was the era that I grew up in and the age that I am. Um, what I do think what an interesting thing is going to come about here, which is not the, the thrust of your caller's question, but he did mention it and make it clear, that we're going to wind up with more and more divergence over time, with decisions being taken in different parts of our country. And it feels rather yeah. arbitrary, as a matter of fact. Whatever the rights and wrongs on this decision, for an English situation to be in one direction and a Welsh to be in another. And just on that point, didn't you find it interesting during the pandemic, I was still in the pandemic, that the biggest crisis we've faced since the Second World War, you, you had huge, diver well, huge, but quite sizable divergence sometimes between the different nations that on something as important as that... Don't you think some of we those were, were just overtly political? Yes. Yeah, it may well have been, but I just thought it was... Odd, they, odd, on, on the slapping or the, the hitting thing, I, broad, I, I think it should be illegal... But I can understand those who worry that we might then be criminalising mums and dads who give their children the tiniest tap on the bum, as Alex says, to try and prevent them from serious harm by rushing across the road. I don't think it's a good enough reason not to make it illegal. And I think in reality, parents will obey it and you'll get very, very few test cases. That but you end run up the risk court. of criminalising an entire group of people, hitherto completely law abiding people who think they're doing the right thing. Have, Charlotte, haven't we got an adequate law in England at the moment where I think if you leave a mark on a child, a bruise, that is quite clear that you've gone too far. But a quick slap across the legs, as Alex suggested, I mean, I'm sure it probably happened to all of us in our childhood. It certainly did me because I was a very naughty child. <laughs> I mean, I, I was a very naughty child, but I have to say I was never... Um, hit by either of my parents and I'm sure there are people that will say that you know that explains a lot about <laughs> why I am the way that I am now and you know maybe it would have been better if they had but it, it's one of those things that I think particularly when you are looking at you know something like hitting a child you're not going to know whether or not you've hit them with sufficient force to leave a bruise until after the fact so that actually strikes me as quite an arbitrary uh, kind of limit to set that if you've left a mark um, you know, because certainly as someone that bruises quite easily, I know that sometimes you'll have a little knock into something and, you know, then you've got a little bruise on your hip for like a week for something that didn't even hurt. And other times you've, you know, really stubbed your toe and there's not a single mark. So in terms of just as a way of marking it, I think it's probably actually easier and neater to just say, you know, this is not a thing that's acceptable. There are much better ways to discipline a child than to put in place a really strange limit around you know what does and doesn't leave a mark because at the point at which your hand goes out presumably you're not going to know whether there's going to be a mark do you not would you not have the the right i mean if you hit a child in anger i mean that's that's what should be outlawed probably mm. but if you are warning a child and you think that's the only way to do it in that particular circumstance surely alex's point about criminalizing a whole group of blameless parents on, is on a, right on a legal and technical point how do you prove what the parents mindset was at the moment at which their hand the went mens rea, because, yeah. because in that case you're saying oh well as long as your intention mm. was to prevent harm rather than to discipline it, it's it, you're again you're asking to it's probably easier and neater to ban it than to try to find reasons not to but also ian you know you don't have to leave a mark to, to a physical mark to leave a, 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 a mental mark a scar when i was at primary school probably i was about five years old my best friend at the time who was only four he his parents were from australia went to australia for holiday came back about a week after term had started i was so excited to see him i ran out of the main assembly hall and ran to give him a hug in the in the little atrium the headmistress came up to us furious got us both by the collars and smashed our heads together i suspect neither of us had a mark but that and surely has to be illegal. This, this is the result. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alec. Gosh, gosh. <laughs> Alec. I mean, look, uh, look, I'm a conservative. I believe personal responsibility and I believe in making judgments. Um, I don't believe my parents actually ever hit me. Um, but my dad could put the fear of God in me when I messed about. And I tell you, did I mess about, especially at school? Um, and he would really lay into me, but I don't think they ever hit me. And I think that it's. My a dad very never old... hit me, my mum did. Yeah. 
neither of my parents, I don't think. I, mean, I think it's a very old-fashioned view, actually, to um, hit a child. It was when there weren't any other sort of punishments nowadays. Think of all the things that children have which they want. You take those away and say you're not having any television for a week, you're not having any electronics for a week, you're not... All those things. There are other ways to discipline now. Um, so if this came which, into the House of Commons, you, you'd vote for a ban, would you? Well, look, I just... <laughs> I'll tell you what I'd want to see before this came to the House of Commons. I'd want to see, actually, that we're getting to grips with the children who are being murdered in this country and social workers seem to be overlooking. But We've got plenty a, of cases there, but there's, an important, but there's an important point, Ian. There's a legislation in place that that shouldn't happen, and yet it is happening. So if you want to bring in more legislation, what are you actually achieving? And I think that's the really important question. I think that... I don't think um, the fact that some people break the law means you should be afraid of bringing in laws that we think are morally right. No, no, I, I accept that point, but at the same time, can we also... But not everyone have accepts ways your premise to, that it's morally to, right. True. To educate people in that, you know, there are so many things you can do to... I haven't got any children. None of us got any children, OK? But, I mean, I've got um, a Jack Russell. He's, he's now 14 years old. You know, puppies are difficult things to train. I don't think I ever actually hit him, but I would stare him in the eyes and show him who's boss. Well, I, that's funny, because I was about to mention dogs. And, I mean, I've got two dogs. I've and I've, two. I've never hit... I would never mm. hit them, but I've tapped them... Mm. Which they don't expect, and they mm. think, oh, what's he done that for? Well, hopefully they then compute it. I, I mean, this is the problem. When you say hit a child, that word mm. hit, it's quite emotive, isn't it? Whereas if you say slap or tap, it's sort of, it kind of makes it more acceptable, or not? No, I think that... I'm I think not that's, sure slap is any better. I, no, well, OK, I think, I think it, it is, and I think that it's a word that was widely recognised for a mild chastisement, and you, you, that's, that's the point. Many of the constituents of both of the MPs here with us will, will, will think there's nothing wrong with that, and one of the things, you, even if you think it's absolutely morally right, is the position that, that Matt sets out, uh, you've got to take the country with you and I think that it's quite difficult uh, that. Mm -hmm. you also do run the risk by the way I think it's Wrexham Football Club where the entrance to the ground is in England and the pitch is in Wales really? who found, yeah who found them um, if your callers will remind me very quickly if I'm wrong but that found themselves on the wrong side of Covid regulation uh, because they <laughs> they played a game in the English League whilst their pitch the literal pitch is in Wales um, uh, the prospect of English parents being extradited back to Wales or having smacked a child on a holiday uh, I, see, I, in reality I don't think it's going to happen I think if you have a parent who gently taps a child, the child isn't going to call out the police. 99.9% oh, no, no, no. of the I th time. I, th I think, you, well, you're probably right on that, I suppose. But I think children are very conscious of, I know my rights, know my rights. and they say mm. it to teachers but all, quite all the time so, in a way that we would never quite, have dreamt quite, of doing. Quite rightly so. And some people, the, the law might not be perfect, but it, it, the, the, the perfect shouldn't be the enemy of, of the good. And I think if, if we want to get to grips with the sort of violence you were talking about, Alec, and violence against women in our society, of which there is far, far too much... We need to set the set the okay. bar pretty high and early in life. You don't want teaching children that violence is okay. O three four five six zero six zero nine seven three. If you'd like to put your call to our panel, Rowan, thank you very much. Just actually, let's go back to Rowan very quickly. Do you agree with the ban in Wales? Yes, absolutely, I do. I think any physical chastisement of a child, no matter if it's a slap or a tap or a hit, is entirely wrong. OK, thank you very much. Um, Alex, you were wrong. It wasn't Wrexham. Oh, there we go. According to Ian in Wrexham, it's Chester. Sorry, Ian. Quite right, too. Chester was what I was after. <laughs> so I, I couldn't find it on my phone, scrambling and looking. 8.47 is the time on LBC. The Spring Statement 2022 on LBC. Put your questions to Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Yeah, we're kind of anticipating our energy bills going up, so we're kind of starting to budget for that. Anything to do with reducing the cost of petrol... Eating. I know, I'm no way off, but there's people worse than me. How are they going to cope with energy increases of £2,000? I think that this £125 that Rishi Sunak is offering is neither here nor there. All household stuff has gone up so much, just can't believe it. On your mental health, when you know that you're worried, and that drains you. They've managed to waste billions. I think they can give more. Put your questions to Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, with Ian Dale, tomorrow evening from 7. Listen on your radio. And on Global Player, LBC. Whether you fancy moving to the country or dream of taking early retirement, a tax-efficient stocks and shares ISA from John Lewis can help you prepare for all the big milestones to come. Little moments can build big futures. 
Go to johnlewisfinance.com to find out more. As with all investing, your capital is at risk. Tax treatment depends on individual circumstances and may change in the future. John Lewis Investment Services are provided by Nutmeg Saving and Investment Limited. We've got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the trade goes. At Selco Builders Warehouse, we've got real deals on a wide range of trade quality building products. In March, save £10 on 2.4 metre use class 4 sleepers, now only £29.99 each expat. Now that's a real deal. Find even more real deals at Selco Builders Warehouse and online at selcobw.com. We've got it at Selco. Selco, it's where the trade go. That charged the 20%. Get ready because the homestyle crispy chicken is back at McDonald's. A delicious crispy chicken breast, bacon, hot and spicy mayo, and a red onion relish, all inside a glazed poppy and sesame seed bun. Delicious. Tuck in until the 26th of April. <laughs> Served after 11am. Subject to availability. Only in participating restaurants. See mcdonalds.co.uk slash homestyle crispy chicken for details. We all know life is full of twists and turns, and sometimes plans just change. So when you travel by train with Avanti West Coast, we make it easy for you to change tickets bought in advance. Just request your change and we'll swap your tickets to a different date or time. You can do that and so much more from our app. Download it today to help with your travel plans. Avanti West Coast. Feel good travel. Advance tickets only. Admit the applies for changes requested after 6pm day before departure. Further conditions apply. <laughs> open plan office. Let's face it, it's noisy with zero privacy. So, speak to the glass office people. They'll transform your workspace with versatile glass partitions. There's minimal disruption. They can work at night and weekends. And no hidden costs. <laughs> That's pretty handy when you're running a business. Use their online pricing tool to see how cost-effective it can be. Theglassofficepeople.co.uk Creating new spaces in places. A squeezing across the chest. A feeling of unease. That sense something's not right. It can be easy to dismiss the early signs of a heart attack, but it's never too early to call 999 and describe your symptoms. Your NHS is here for you. My prostate cancer was, thankfully, caught in the nick of time. But it shouldn't be down to luck. Men at higher risk are... Aged over 50. Those with a family history of the disease. Or black men, or the 45. Check your risk of prostate cancer now. Search Risk Checker or visit prostatecanceruk.org. Men, we are with you. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 8.51. I don't know what Reese has been... Hang, hang on, we're, we're, we're on air again, Alex. This is a radio show. Um, Reese on a tweet says, are we actually listening to a conversation from three old men without children trying to justify hitting a child? I actually feel sick. I, I'm not sure what conversation you were listening to, but it must have been on a different radio station because I think I was the only one that was vaguely trying to justify it on the basis that everyone else disagreed, so I played devil's advocate, but there we go. Oh, so we're not that old. I am. Uh. I am. <laughs> right, let's. We have with us uh, Charlotte Nichols, Alex Shelbrook, Alex Dean, and Matt Stadlin. Let's go to another question. It's a text question from Chris, who doesn't give a location, it says here. Do the panel think the royal family will shrink further and lose head of state status outside the UK? Well, that's already happened. Was it Barbados, Barbados last last year wasn't in it? Jamaica this year after the departure of, of William and Kate? They know not what they do. I agree. So, but do you think that is likely to happen now, particularly when the awful day comes, if you get my drift, um, that, that will be a, a, a real... Well, uh, that, that, that is the argument that the Republican movement in Australia had, had made after its defeat. They said, we wouldn't come back to this in the lifetime of the serving monarch. Mm. The peculiar phraseology that they, they always used. I think it's inevitable that some people in some countries will have a go. That's not to say it will necessarily enjoy success. And of course, some countries leave the Commonwealth only to rejoin it later. Mm. Not necessarily to have the Queen as head of state, but to be part of the Commonwealth. And I think the most important thing for me, uh, whilst I respect um, our, our Queen greatly, the most important question for me is that we maintain the soft power of the links in the Commonwealth rather than actually whether in the modern age they kept the Queen as formally their head of state or not. Charlotte? I mean, that's something that I broadly agree with. I think it's um, something that is a decision for each individual country. And if it's going to be something that gets put to a referendum in different places, then I think it's a good thing that it's something that they opt into. And I hope that it's something that, um, you know, these places will maintain and we can keep those links. But 
Um, you know, obviously the Queen has been the Queen for a very long time. Um, you know, both in my sort of parents' and grandparents' lifetimes, we've never known another monarch. And as you said, when when there is a time when she is no longer our monarch, I expect that question will probably be asked in a lot more jurisdictions. Um, what about here? Do you think it, it is ever going to become a real debate in this country? I, I think it's still very much a minority position. Even people who I know who are quite sort of staunchly Republican often have a lot of respect for the Queen as monarch and head of state. And I think the idea of not having that is not something that has particularly widespread popularity. I don't think there's any harm in asking the question, but I, I don't think I, it's a question that's going to get the answer that some people okay. think that it Alec. would. Well, I think, I mean, I think there's so many aspects to this. Let's just talk about this country for a session, second. And, and I think this leads on to the other countries. There is a world of difference between a um, monarchy as head of state and a politician as head of state. And if you think of some of the tragedies that have occurred in this country, um, I think people get a lot more comfort and a lot more um, support in themselves from um, having a visit from a member of the royal family than they do perhaps a politician, which is immediately going to be polarising for some people. Um, and I think that, that we come back to the soft power and that ability, what it does. So some of the other countries maybe going for referendums may get to that question of, but what would the alternative be? Um, they may be looking... Let's pull it out of the, the United States over the last few years and, and who's been elected president and how these things came about. And they might think, actually, you know what? I quite like the fact that my um, head of state has nothing to do with politics at all. One thing we do know is that Prince Charles has made it crystal clear that he intends to sh shrink the royal family, its size, its cost. And indeed, he, he, um, there are reports about the whole um, coronation, etc., are going to be much more... Um, oh, you see, down. that's ridiculous. I agree. I, I mean, we're known great, for that. I think we do very well. Yeah. One thing I'm we do brilliantly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I understand, but I think pageantry is a great thing that we mm. do very successfully. Are you a royalist, Matt? I sort of am, actually. I mean, I, every time England play rugby or football, I stand up wherever I am in the world. I did it in South Africa, actually, the other day, and I stand up, put my hand on my chest, and I sing. I either sing the national anthem or I respect it's very it. very American, mm -hmm. isn't it? Putting your hand yeah, on your yeah. chest. But, but I think there is, should that, when that awful day happens, which none of us can bring ourselves to articulate exactly, I think there, w there is a real chance for a rupture, both domestically and abroad. Abroad, I think, because Commonwealth, and we're talking about the Commonwealth because of the visit to Belize at the moment, case of William, the Commonwealth is a legacy of empire, and when that day happens, there will be a reason for countries to reevaluate their relationship with this country. I agree with Alex when he said the importance of soft power, and also just the relationship we have, the bilateral relationship we have these countries within the Commonwealth. Domestically, and I think this is really important, what Alex said about the difference between being visited by a member of the royal family and a politician, Prince Charles, whether we like him or not, is almost a politician. He's advocated, and I agree with what he's advocated, I, I happen to, for the, for the climate and for the environment for years. We know what he thinks on really important issues. And therefore, he's different to the Queen. And I think we, there will be a form of re-evaluation with the monarchy when that moment comes, because one of the great things about the Queen, and she's been absolutely extraordinary for all these decades, is that we don't know what she thinks. No. She's neutral. We do know what Charles thinks, even if most of us might agree broadly with him, and therefore I think that will cause some sort of re-evaluation. Uh, right, let's move on to our final fun text question, which everybody looks forward to, from Simon in Sheffield. Ian, great to hear about this DIY boom on your show earlier. What's the most ambitious DIY project your panel have embarked on and maybe failed at? In my case, every single DIY project that I have embarked on, I failed at. <laughs> now, Matt Studden, I, I, I can't really picture you with a saw or a, a screwdriver lot. or anything. I mean, you obviously don't ever look at my Instagram photographs. I always I try look not at yours. to. Well, uh, my, 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 my example is in, 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 in October, I ripped up. I just look at all these wonderful pictures of your girlfriend. But, Stop. Uh, I, ripped up, <laughs> I ripped up the whole of my backyard, the rotten decking. Okay. I did 11 trips. Class, ele 11 trips to the RBKC dump. So that was 11 hours, because half an hour there is okay. in Wandsworth. Too much half detail hour. Now. But my, my point is, I did it, I ripped out the plant, it was deeply satisfying, and then I got the builders to lay some ah, stone. You see, I can rip things out, it's just that I can't create. Alex? I unblocked the drains at my parents' house, it was disgusting, and in retrospect, if I could have got someone else to do it, I would have done it. Alec? 
Well, as a former kitchen and bathroom fitter, I think... Hey, I'm yeah, yeah, really? not <laughs> I think I'm probably cheating at this one. <laughs> <laughs> OK, all right, we all admit defeat. Apart from Charlotte, can you compete with that? I mean, I can't compete with kitchen and bathroom fitting, but I am basically the queen of IKEA flat pack. You know, I laugh in the face of two-man assembly. Can put up a cat, <laughs> book chase, no problem, all by myself. It always you know. defeats me. I'm the person with just got three screws left over. <laughs> Where, where's the Allen key? <laughs> <laughs> Falls apart when you sit on it. There's I'm a joke like there somewhere. Not as DIY, yes, but sure uh, you know, I'm, I'm claiming yeah, it's it. DIY. Yeah, it's DIY. Okay, well, we learned a bit more about uh, more about our panel's talents on DIY than I probably thought we would. Simon, thank you very much indeed for that. Uh, Charlotte, thank you for making it and getting here. We've enjoyed thank your company. You. you don't know what you missed in the first half hour, but you can catch up on the podcast I, or on Global. Player. I will make sure to. Do I'm that. sure you will. Uh, Alex Shelbrook, thank you to you too. Matt Stadlin, good to see you again, and also Alex Dean thank coming. You very much. Coming up in the next hour, we are going to talk about corruption in the police because a report out today from Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary and Fire and Rescue Services, there's a mouthful for you, says that um, poli the police, the Metropolitan Police, are not fit for purpose when it comes to rooting out corruption within their own ranks. Now, some of you will think, oh God, it's Ian Dale going on about the police again. What has he got against the police? Well, if you don't think that this report is worth debating, for an hour with you, then I'm sorry for you, because it is. If the police can't root out their own corruption, how do you expect them to root it out in the rest of society? 0345 6060 973. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. global 